morning, everybody, and welcome to our online service. The title of my sermon this morning is, We Are the Resistance. But before we continue, let us just close our eyes and pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this privilege to come into your presence, knowing that you are with us. Where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of us. And Lord, we ask you this morning that you will come and open our eyes of our understanding, that we may hear your word, that we may grasp it, that it may bear fruit in us, so that you may be glorified. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, Pastor Heinrich preached a sermon, and part of that sermon really stood out for me, where Pastor Heinrich mentioned the fact that the church will keep on standing. I don't know if you remember that analogy of that movie, Sing, and the gorilla behind the piano singing, We Are Still Standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, Pastor Heinrich then briefly mentioned Ephesians chapter 6, which refers to this fact that we are still standing. And I want us just to read that together as an introduction to where we're going this morning. Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the vials of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded yourself your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shone your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Having done all to stand, withstand in the day of evil. It, it reminds me so vividly, if you look at Greek, this word literally means to hold something up, to prop it up, to enable it to withstand whatever is coming against it. Like crossing a river in flood. I don't know if you've ever done that before. But when the current sweeps to one direction and you need to go up against the current. First, you need to find your, your footing. You need to be able to withstand the current. I remember as a kid, I grew up at the sea. One of my favorite games was to battle against the waves. As a little chokerki, I used to go into the sea and have this game against the sea, the waves, whether I will be able to withstand the waves as it come crashing down. And, and so, so vividly I see as Paul describes that we need to stand, do everything to stand so that we can withstand in the day of evil. And this was just a confirmation of what I believe the Lord is speaking to me for us as a church. I was reading 1 John 5 verse 19 and it says the following. We know that we are children of God. And that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Two things that the Apostle John asserts as certain. Two things that he knows for sure. That first of all, that we are indeed children of God through faith in Christ. And second, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Do not be fooled. Do not be deceived. This is not a conspiracy theory. The way the world thinks, what it values, and how it acts is under the control of the evil one. In 1 John 5, 19, in the ESV, it puts it powerfully. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You see, there are only two kingdoms in the universe. The kingdom of God, which is called the kingdom of light, and the kingdom of darkness, which is the kingdom of Satan. They rule through authority and power, and their control stretches to those who submit to them. They are two opposing kingdoms ruled by two different kings. And you're either in the one or the other, because there are only two. And you are in the kingdom under whose rule you submit. That is the determining factor. 
The determining factor in whose kingdom you are is under whose authority you submit. Luke 4, we read so powerfully where Jesus was tempted by Satan. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And then the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you would worship, submit before me, all will be yours. And then Jesus so powerfully answered, Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. The whole world is under the control of Satan. And the one you submit to is the one in whose kingdom you belong. It is a choice of following the way of God or following the way of Satan. These two kingdoms are not primarily physical kingdoms that can be identified through a physical border. Rather, they are determined by whom we submit to as king. You know, Jesus in, in Luke 17 from verse 20 says, Once being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. It was in their midst because Jesus was standing right there with them. These kingdoms are not primarily physical places. You can have two people being in the same physical place, at the same house, at the same address, yet being in two different kingdoms. John and Jesus started their ministry with a simple message. Repent, turn around, turn away from the world because the kingdom of God is at hand. It is at hand because it literally means has drawn near because Jesus was there. Jesus was on the earth and the kingdom has come near because the king is here. And whoever chooses to submit to his authority, to his ways, will be granted access into his kingdom. Now, very interestingly, if I may ask you this question, when will the kingdom of God be fully established on the earth? It is when Jesus returns, when he comes back. Then the kingdom of God will be fully established on the earth. All the parables of the kingdom of God has this theme. The king goes away and when he returns, everything happens. Or the servants is waiting for the bridegroom to arrive and then everything happens. What is going to happen when Jesus returns? While he's going to judge and destroy all that is under the control of Satan, even this physical world. Yes, even the physical world will be destroyed and be replaced with a new earth. And Satan and all that followed him will be cast into hell. And then Christ is going to rule and reign absolutely with everyone who followed him. Now, standing back for a moment and just looking at the big picture of what did God do through sending His Son into this world? Christ came into the world controlled by Satan to establish something. And then He left. But He's coming back to complete what He started. So what, what was it that He came to establish? What did Christ come to do before He went back to the Father and it's so interesting to see what he did was to establish a way for man to be saved, to be redeemed, to be freed from the power of sin and death, and thus disarming Satan's power over humanity, giving man the opportunity to choose, to switch sides. Who are you going to follow? Because everything that kept you bondage as slaves has been broken by the death and resurrection of Christ so that you can choose in whose side you want to belong. Then he poured out his spirit in those who chose to follow him, who was redeemed by his sacrifice, as a seal to prove that they are different to the world and to empower them to do something. To do something while we wait for his return. 
And then he left us. He left us in the enemy's territory, controlled by the evil one, for a purpose. If we read John 17, as Jesus prays for his disciples, he said, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You see, we are no longer part of this world, a world controlled by Satan. We are part of the resistance. Jesus clearly prayed that God would not take us out, but leave us here. But not alone with His Spirit to empower us to do something, to be something. Jesus did not take his disciples with him when he ascended to heaven, but left his disciples behind deliberately, asking that the Father would not take them with, but protect them from the evil one. And he did not leave them alone, but asked the Father to send the Holy Spirit to be with them, but also to empower them. The question is to empower to do what? Well, we know the answer is to make disciples. It sounds a lot like recruiting a resistance in enemy territory. Training and equipping them to fight inside the enemy's territory while the main force is preparing an invasion. Go and make disciples. Go and recruit more to the resistance. We are called out of the world into the kingdom of God. Trained and equipped through the word and empowered by the Holy Spirit to be different to the world, to be light in the darkness, following the way, the teaching, the example of Christ, the way of the kingdom of God, which is completely different to the way of this world. We are the resistance. We are called to stand against the way of the world. As Ephesians 6 said, having done all to stand, stand therefore, like resisting a strong current, like moving upstream. And we need to put on the armor of God to be able to resist and stand against this world. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we are meant to fight in a resistance against the way of the world. But how do we fight in this resistance? Is it by storming the capital like in America? Is it taking up arms and flag, flags and beating policemen? Is that the way we are meant to fight? That is the way the world fights, not the way of the kingdom. That is the way of the world. Jesus made it clear in John 18 verse 36. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. So I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. So do we fight with physical weapons? Well, 2 Corinthians 10 makes it very clear. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every petition that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Do we kill our enemies? Well, Jesus says, you've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. So that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. And so how will we then overcome the evil one? Romans 12 says, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, but... Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So powerful. Do not be overcome by evil the way the world fights, the way the world does, but overcome evil with good. 
You see, we are the resistance. We resist the ways of the world and we do everything to stand, stand against the current, the ways of the world, and we resist with the ways of God, with His armor given to us. And that's another sermon empowered by the Holy Spirit to be different, not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with His ways, His good. Jesus came into the world to establish a resistance that will continue to fight until He returns. Not to fight the way the world fights, but differently. The way He taught, the way He showed us. Paul did not march into Rome with an army, people. He did not march into Rome to see the empire with a might of weapons and flags. No, he had a more powerful weapon. But my time is up, and I have to leave that for next time. But I will end with this. Like in all the good movies, the resistance have a name. And do you know what God calls his resistance? He calls it the church. And so the question this morning is, as Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. The question this morning is, in which camp are you standing? Are you part of the resistance, the church, or are you part of the world? And yes, we are recruiting. We are recruiting a resistance. We are recruiting for the church. Not the shofar church, God's church. And we're asking you a question, are you willing to join us? Are you willing to step out of the world and be part of the resistance, the church of God? And if that is you, I'm going to encourage you, sign up. There's a link below, the Walk Like Jesus Walk Challenge. If you haven't yet, go listen to my sermon a few weeks ago. Follow me. Listen to that sermon that summarizes what we're doing with this challenge. And then I want to invite you to come to our midweek meetings on Wednesdays, 6.30, here at the back of the church. We meet together, everybody that is signing up, signing up to walk and to fight the way Jesus taught and showed us. To live our lives asking this question, what would Jesus do? And to do everything to stand against the world and the ways of the world. And most importantly, to overcome the world. But that's for another time. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can be here not as those who are running away, but those who are in Christ are bold and confident about the victory. Not that we will achieve, but what you have already achieved. And that we can walk in your steps, controlled by your Spirit. Lord, I pray that you will grant us to know your will and to live it so that we may see your kingdom come in this earth. And Lord, I thank you for this privilege to be part of your side, your kingdom, to be part of the church. God, I pray that you'll lead us to see our role in it, that we may live it in such a way that you may be glorified. And so, Lord, I pray for the boldness for decisions to be made to let go of the world and to embrace your kingdom and your ways so that we may reap where it leads to eternal life. A life with you forever and ever. And Lord, so I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless you as you choose to follow him every day. Also, just a few announcements. Of course, we are starting Bible school on the 23rd of February. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to grow in your relationship with God. And the detail of all these things that I so briefly mentioned about the purpose of Jesus coming and what will happen in the end. If you want to know more, join us in Bible school and you will certainly learn more about these truths. And then, of course, every Wednesday at 6.30, we're meeting behind the church. What would Jesus, or walk like Jesus would, challenge. And, and as we share with one another um, how we live out this question, what would Jesus do in our everyday life? And to see how God transforms us as we continue to follow Him. 